Well, good morning, Moraine Valley Church. What a fun, exciting morning already. I was wondering if you parents could help me out, inspire me this morning. It's exciting to have you up here. I wonder if you could get on the edge of your seat with your cameras out now that I'm preaching. And make me feel like you're so excited that Pat is up there. We just can't wait for this sermon. Thank you, Michael. Ah, Abby, thank you. All right, you guys are awesome, man. Thank you. I'm inspired now. I can't wait to give this message. Even though I am excited about this announcement, too. Karen and Joe Drodes are excited to announce the engagement of their son, Matt Drodes, to Jess Parati. Are they here today? Well, are, are, well there you are. So, congratulations, guys. Congratulations. You know, after you uh, hear part of this story, you may wonder about my moral qualifications to be the pastor of your church at Moraine Valley Church. But did you know that I was kicked out of being an altar boy for bad behavior <laughs> by a priest? That's true. So I thought if they wouldn't take me and let me be an altar boy, I could be a pastor <laughs> in a Baptist church. So that's what I did, man. So thank you for allowing me to do that. But many years later, after I came to know Jesus, I remember the very next day, I put my faith in Christ, and I knew that something deep inside of me changed the moment I trusted Jesus. I was a guy that felt dirty all the time because I lived a dirty life. But when I trusted Jesus deep in the core of my being, there was a cleansing, cleansing and a feeling of freedom and cleanliness I never knew before. So the very next day I was in Los Angeles, um, took a leave for the weekend from the uh, military base up in Los Angeles. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to church because um, you know, just came to know Jesus. That seems like, I hadn't been to church in many, many years. So I went to a Catholic church. I grew up as a Catholic. And as I was sitting in the um, service, I wanted to take communion. And if you know anything about the Catholic church, as I did growing up, there's a confessional in the back. You can go during the service, give your confessional so you can be ready for the communion time. And so I went to the back um, just excited with my newfound faith. And I said, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession has been five years ago. And I'm sure he was getting settled in for a long time in the booth with me. <laughs> and I said, I swore yesterday. That's it. He said, isn't there anything else? I said, I don't need to tell you anything else because I told Jesus my sins yesterday. And he forgave me. And what ensued in that confessional was an argument between me and the priest. <laughs> because he said, you can't do that. You've got to tell your sins to a priest to be forgiven. I said, no. I told them to Jesus yesterday, and I don't have to tell them to you. And so we, we went back and forth. He did not leave happy. I did not leave happy. But uh, we got in this little battle. But you know what? The thing I realized is we're both right. He was right, you need to bring your sins to a priest. Nobody can represent themselves before God. But on the other hand, I was right, because I brought him to Jesus, because there's no other priest like Jesus. He is not just a priest, amen. He's not just a priest, he is the priest of all priests. Matter of fact, his priesthood is so good and so permanent that he abides today as my priest and your priest who settled our sins forever before God. We've got some great news to look at today, and it's all connected with Christmas. Now, as you listen to my message today, you're probably going to say, what does this have to do with Christmas? Hang with me. You'll see near the end. This is what Christmas is all about. But you need to follow through with me to understand and see that. So, 
Biblically, I got the definition up here from a guy named uh, David Levy, a teacher with the Friends of Israel. The priest's sacred responsibility was to represent the Israelites before God and God before the Israelites. So they, were, they represented us. And they represent, they represent us, or I should say Israel before God. And God, they represented God before Israel by teaching them God's will, teaching them the Mosaic law, caring for the tabernacle and the temple, and offering sacrifices in worship to God. That's what a priest did. But there were, while there were many priests that carried this out, there was only one high priest. The high priest was the priest that was over all the other priests. He was the priest that was over the entire religious life of Israel. He is the one who went one time a year on the Day of Atonement into the Holy of Holies to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people before God, representing both himself and the people as he went into there to offer up his sins. I love this um, passage in Exodus 28. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to chew this thing I have in my mouth. I've been coughing all week, so I thought I'd take a little pill, and now I, I can feel the kind of a, so I'm sorry. Give me a second here. We'll get rid of that. You guys are going, what's that guy doing with his mouth up there, man? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, by the way, did you notice Lamb Chop is up with us this morning? He'll be a part of the service as well. You'll understand later on how Lamb Chop fits in as well. But you know, I love this verse, and I hope it encourages you as you pray. It really does me. Because this is what the priest did. Aaron, who was the high priest, Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. You know what he's saying here? He had a breastplate, and he had on there the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And as he carried that, as he put that breastplate over his heart, and as he walked into the Holy of Holies, guess what? He was representing Israel. He was carrying their names over their heart. So as he walked in to do what he was going to do before God, he was carrying the names of the people of Israel with him to do that. That's what intercessory prayer is, by the way. <laughs> because when I come and I pray for Moraine Valley Church, the imagery I get in my mind is the very one of this passage. It's because I'm not only praying for myself, I'm bringing the people of Moraine and your faces and your names are carried on my heart. And as you pray for Moraine Valley, or you pray for your kids, or you pray for your family, that's what you're doing. You're representing them before God. And that's what a priest did. They represented Israel before God. The second thing they did, the high priest in particular, I'm, I'm talking about, we're talking about the high priest now, is their main job was to offer that sacrifice one time a year for the sins of the people. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5 in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to look on with somebody today. If you have it on your phone, we have some under the seats. You're going to be looking at a lot of passages today. And we're going to be seeing something about understanding a priesthood. The necessity for it, just what they did and how Jesus is our priest. Oh, man. It's a terrible thing doing to a microphone. I'm sorry. Wow, you guys thought by this time this guy would learn a few lessons. <laughs> Hebrews 5.1 says this, and Pete, you can put it up there for those. That most of these we'll be looking at out of the Bible, but this one I did put on there, this. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God. There he is, he's representing man. He's appointed... Among, uh, uh, on behalf of men in things relating to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So this high priest, his other job was especially is to represent the people of Israel before God when he brought the sacrifice into the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies, and shed the blood 
for the forgiveness of the sins of Israel. Well, over time, Aaron was the first priest. Out of his family line came the, uh, the priesthood, the, the Levites. Uh, Aaron was the high priest. And um, over time, the, the priesthood got corrupted. They, they didn't do their job real well. Matter of fact, Malachi 1 tells us this. They got to the place that God had to condemn the priests because their offerings despised God. They dishonored God because when they brought offerings to God, they didn't take the best offerings in the flock to give to God. They found defective offerings. And they brought those to God, and God said, you're despising me. Go give that to your governor and see how happy he would be if you gave him a, a, a shabby offering that was defective. I'm the holy God, and you're bringing me this. So the priesthood had corrupted itself in many, many ways over the years, down to the point that when Jesus was standing on trial, do you realize it was the high priest at that time, the chief priest of all the priests of Israel, who stood face to face with Jesus, questioning him and condemning him for claiming to be the Christ. Now stop and think about that. These are the guys who taught the people about God's word, the priest. The high priest was the top guy in the ball game. He was the top priest of all the priests. He's the guy for years have been teaching people about a Messiah, the Christ, who was going to come to Israel to save them and deliver them. And now the Messiah is standing right in front of them. He'd been studying about him out of the book. He'd been teaching others about him out of the book. And now he's standing right in front of them. And he didn't even recognize who was standing in front of him. The Messiah himself. And he's the one who said, what further evidence do we need? He's deserving of death. It was the high priest himself, the chief religious leader in Israel. If anybody should have known who this was, it should have been that guy. But the priesthood had become so corrupted and so blinded by that time, they didn't even see who was standing in front of them in the person of Jesus, the Messiah himself. And the, the irony is that Jesus was also a priest. <laughs> Matter of fact, he was a high priest. No, actually, he was the high priest. The high priest like no other high priest that ever existed in Israel or ever will exist in Israel in the future. He was the one and only, no other high priest like him, better than, more than, than any other high priest ever existed. Jesus. And he was condemned by the high priest existing at that time. In the book of Hebrews, you hear, it was written to prove this very point, that Jesus is the high priest like no other high priest. He's the high priest par excellence. He was the high priest that was better than and more than any other high priest that ever existed. And when you look at this section of Hebrews, it's broken up into two major sections. Uh, basically in chapters 5 to 7, it was written to prove that Jesus is a priest that is more than and better than any other priest. Then you look at chapters 8 to 9, and it's written to show that Jesus' offering was better than and more than any other offering that was ever made. So that's the whole storyline of chapters 5 through 10 in Hebrews. Jesus is a better priest than ever, any priest that ever existed. His offering is better than any offering that was ever made. That's Hebrews 5 through 10. Let me just show you that real quick, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what this has to do with you and me in Christmas. See, the reason why Jesus was the high priest par excellent and better than any other high priest because he was God. God is eternal. 
God is perfect. God is without sin. He lives forever. But the problem with the other priests is they were human like you and me, and they were beset with weaknesses, they were beset with sin, and they died. Therefore, there had to be priest after priest after priest, generation after generation after generation, because they would die. But Jesus, because he's eternal, can be a priest forever and can save forever. Listen to Hebrews chapter 7. Turn to chapter 7. And I hope you're looking in a Bible or look out because, guys, there is some rich stuff here in Hebrews. We're just going to fly over real quick this morning. Verse 23 of Hebrews 7 says this. The former priest, on the one hand, existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, Jesus lives forever, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make an intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of oath, which came through the law, points a son made perfect forever. So we see that Jesus was a much better priest than all the rest of the high priests because he is eternal. He lives on and he's sinless. But then you move into chapters 8 and 10 and we see that Jesus offered a better sacrifice. You see, what we learn in this section as you compare the two, the, the priest in the Old Testament, they offered animals for sacrifices. They would come back repeatedly year after year and offer these sacrifices, and these sacrifices were designed to be a reminder of their sin. But Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice he did it one time, and he removed sin. Aren't you grateful, guys, for that? Jesus' sacrifice was not designed to remind us of our sinfulness. Guys, it's there to remind us of our forgiveness. He removed sin from us. And that's why Jesus' offering us so much. It was a better offering because it was God himself going to the cross and our sins placed upon him so that we could be saved forever. Listen to this in Hebrews 9. We'll just, let me just show you this in a bit. Look at verse 11 in Hebrews 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. Jesus, got by, you understand, he entered into God's presence with this. Remember in the Old Testament, they had a tabernacle that was set up according to the design of heaven and God gave what it's supposed to be like, made here with human materials here on earth by man. And what he's saying is, you know what? Jesus' sacrifice didn't go into the Holy of Holies on earth, made in a tabernacle in a building. His went right into the presence of God in heaven. And so when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood 
of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Then look at verses 3 and 4 in chapter 10. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is, note this, impossible. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Sins were covered. They were reminded of sins, but those offerings by the animals, it's impossible to take away sin. Now, let me just give you one other piece here that fits in in Hebrews. The presenting problem here in Hebrews is perfection. Let me, let me, let me tell you what I mean by that, by perfection. Put up that uh, slide, Pete. In Hebrews, when he's talking about perfection, he's talking about the perfect righteousness which the law demanded and Christ provided which allows for full access into the presence of God. Don't need another priest to stand there for you. Jesus did that. Now you can walk fully into the presence of God. Complete forgiveness of all your sins, totally acceptable to God, and a complete salvation. So that's what he's talking about, perfection. You see, let me tell you this. God is holy and perfect, and he demands perfection holiness and perfection to come into a relationship with him. Now, let me clarify the word demands there. I think you understand perfection. You know, without flaw, no error, nothing falling short. You understand holy, separate like nobody else. When it says God demands perfection, it doesn't mean that God stands up there and says, Abby, you're not perfect, so get out of here. I demand you, get out of here. Get away from me. See, we, we, kind of, we think of that sometimes. God demands holiness and perfection. And so it's kind of like, yeah, God's up there. You're not holy. You're not perfect. Get out of here. Get away from me. I demand it. I demand holiness. No, that's not what he means. When, when we say he demands holiness is this. Unholiness and holiness can't mix together. It's impossible. You can't do it. That's what I mean when he say he demands perfection. You see, because a holy, perfect God can only have fellowship with someone that is in the same standings with God and acceptable before him completely. So it's not a matter that God in this kind of angry, judging God saying, I demand that you be holy, get away from me. It's a God who, because he is holy, you can't have a relationship with him unless you're holy. You follow me? Are we together here? And this is what Hebrews is talking about. We see here in Hebrews, look at uh, chapter 7, verse 11. I'll show you a few verses and then tell you what this has to do with Christmas. Look at chapter 7, verse 11. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? What he's saying here is this, guess what? The priesthood could not make anybody perfect. The work of the Levitical priest who came from the line of Aaron, they could not make anybody perfect. That's why Jesus came uh, of, of my, uh, uh, according to Melchizedek, one who lives forever, a whole different order, a whole different kind of priest. The priest that came from Aaron did not have the ability to make anybody acceptable to God. And then you read on and you see in verse 19 of the same chapter, not only were the priests unable, but the law is unable to make anybody perfect before God. Look at verse 18. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. He's talking about the Mosaic law, man. 
It was set aside because of its weakness and its uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there's a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Guess who that better hope is? It's Jesus. And so the law did not have the ability. And guys, what, this was the best law that ever existed. This was God's law. And it demanded, it told us about the righteousness that God demanded, but it couldn't provide it. And then we see the sacrifices in 10.1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. The priest couldn't make anybody perfect. The law couldn't make anybody perfect. The sacrifices, they could not put us in a position where we would be acceptable from God for, before God, fully forgiven, completely saved, fully acceptable to God. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. You see, those things were only, as we see here, they're a shadow. I don't know if you can see here, but this is me. That's my shadow right there. I'm the reality. The shadow is just a, a fuzzy outline of who I am. Jesus was the reality. The priest, the law, the sacrifices were kind of a foreshadowing of Jesus and what he was going to do, kind of a fuzzy picture we couldn't see all the way, but, but all of a sudden we, we, we get a sense as Jesus comes, he's the reality of the priesthood, he's the reality of the sacrifice, he's the reality of the law, he's the fulfillment of the law, he is the one who's the reality that is able to make perfect. And that's what chapter 10, verse 14 says. Look at this. This summarizes this whole section of 5 through 10 we just looked at. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Guys, that's good news. For by one offering, he has sanctified for all time is perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. So now about this time, Lord, what in the world has this got to do with Christmas? Let me see if I can explain that to you. It's very simple. The birth of Jesus is the means by which he received a body. And the sins of mankind were placed upon the body of Jesus so that he could be the sacrifice that could give us the perfection that's necessary for us to come into a relationship with God. God became flesh. God added flesh. Jesus is the God-man. He's the only priest that ever existed that was both God and man. And he had to be born and take on a body because the body is the place that had to go to the cross as Jesus, the God-man, a real man, a real God in a real body went to the cross to pay for our sins so we can receive that perfect salvation. Look at Hebrews 10. I love this verse. Knocked me out of my seat when I read it. Look at verse 5 of Hebrews 10. Speaking of Jesus, therefore, when he comes into the world. When did Jesus come into the world? When he was born, right? Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. What he's saying here is this. You know what? All these sacrifices and offerings that you've been bringing before me isn't what I've been desiring. That can't make you perfect. But I've made a body for Jesus because he's the perfect sacrifice who can bring us together into a relationship with God. So at the birth, you've heard him said many times, he was born to die. 
Jesus received a body. The eternal God added flesh to himself and he walked here on earth a perfect sinless life as God and he took that perfect sinless body to the cross and our sins were placed upon him and he died so that we can come into a perfect relationship with God because we could never do it for ourselves nor can any other human do it for us even one in a religious position like myself as a pastor. It's Jesus' birth. Without his birth, there would have never been a cross. And without the cross, we never could have had the perfect righteousness that Christ provided. The full access to God. Complete forgiveness of all our sins. Totally acceptable to God with a complete salvation. Without the birth, no cross. Without the cross, no perfect salvation and righteousness. Am I saying, what, you guys all of a sudden that know Jesus are perfect? No. God gives us as a gift. He credits to our account like an accountant. He takes the righteousness of Jesus and says, Pat, I know you're a mess and you could never make it. So I'm going to credit to your account because you're trusting me in what Jesus did, the very righteousness of Jesus. So now I've received that perfect righteousness as a gift. And so when God looks at me, he looks at me through the lenses. On these lenses are write, written Jesus, his perfection. And now when God looks, you know, when his lenses are on, you look at me and you say, man, that guy's a sinner. He's rotten. He's weak. He's full of, he's beset with weaknesses and sins. But when all of a sudden you put on the Jesus lens, and that's what God does. And now he looks at me through the eyes of Jesus. And as the scripture says, I'm hidden in Christ. When God looks at me, he sees Jesus' righteousness now rather than myself. Now I want to speak just a moment to those who are believers in Jesus. You know what? I'm not going to blow it again in front of you, but I'm going to wipe it. Sick this week. Thanks for turning it off, Ryan. Good catch, bro. You're a pro on that thing. There's people here, I know it, who have come to know Jesus. And because of a sin in your life, something you did, you bear tremendous shame and guilt. It's one of those things you hope, man, hope nobody else ever finds out about it. It's one of those things that's kind of like, even when you come before God, you cringe a little bit because you feel embarrassed because you think, God's probably thinking about this as I come to him. You see, it may be a sin we committed before we knew Christ. It may be a sin we knew, committed afterwards. But over there is eternity past. God created the world. And we have all this Old Testament history come. And then Jesus was born and he came into the world. Jesus lived that perfect life. And he came and he made a sacrifice for my sins so that my sins could be paid and I could receive that perfect salvation. Well, history's gone on since the cross many hundreds and thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, I'm born. And I start to live my life. And there's something inside of me that drives me to want to want to run my own life my own way rather than God's way. They call that sin. And I'm living my life and I'm doing a lot of things on my own that are not pleasing to God. And then at some point for me when I was 21 in the Marine Corps, I came to know Jesus. And I put my trust, I stopped saying I'm going to try to be good enough and religious enough to be acceptable to God and I'm going to put my trust in what Jesus did for me as my only hope. And at that moment, I was saved. And I'm starting to live my life as a believer in Jesus. But guess what? I still find myself sinning now and then. Sometimes I get in seasons where I'm trapped by it. Sometimes I'm caught by some big thing I can't believe I've done. You follow me? And so we're walking on, and so here I am as a believer, and I'm down here today, and I'm saying to myself, I can't believe I did that. And I'm full of so much guilt 
in shame and embarrassment and it's almost humiliating for me to stand before God and I'm hoping nobody else in the world ever finds out about it. See, the good news of this truth is that Jesus has dealt with all our sins for all time. All of them. Think with me for a second. You came to know Jesus here. Jesus died over here. How many of your sins were future at the time that Jesus died? All of them. We think in time sequences, and I think, well, I came to know Jesus here. Yeah, he took care of all these sins over here when I trusted him. But what about the ones that I committed over here? The reality is, is that when Jesus went to the cross, all of our sins in our life, past, present, and future, went to the cross with him. He paid for all of our sins and took care of it all right then. Let me give you one verse to encourage you. Yep. You know, praise God. Amen. Look down at verse 11 of chapter 10. Again, I'm speaking to those here who are struggling with guilt and shame that know Jesus because of a sin sometime in your life. Listen to what he says. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. We talked about that. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand. What do you do after you're done working? You sit down. The job's done. Jesus doesn't have to come back next year and do it again. He did one offering for all time, and he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time onward until the enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Guess what? In God's eyes, you're acceptable for all time once you put your trust in Jesus. This has a lot to say about those who think you can lose your salvation because you sinned. This has a lot to say about those who are feeling guilt. And you know what we need to do, guys? You know what they did in the Old Testament? That's why Lamb Chop is here today. I just, what they did is they had an innocent little lamb that was sacrificed in their place to pay for their sins. We've read about that. This priest comes, he takes an animal, uh, it's the blood of the animal that's sacrificed before God, they lose their life. And what they did in the Old Testament was this. Lamb chop, and I was told, and I, 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 I haven't studied this out, but if it's true, it, it's amazing. I was told that usually that sacrifice would come and live in their house for a few weeks beforehand. It will be one of theirs. It became like a pet. So guess what? That pet was very precious to them. But now is the day to go and sacrifice for my sins, and I bring my offering to the priest. And what do I do is this. I put my hands on the offering because this offering, two things happen when I put my hands upon that offering. One is that it has my sins has transferred on to the sins of this animal. It's a substitute for me. They're carrying my sins. And I identify myself with this animal. So now when this animal is slain before God, it's Pat's sins who's going in. There's a substitute to pay for Pat's sins. You following me? And so when he was shed, my sins would be covered. But I come back next year and I'd have to offer another one. You know, they, they did it even more than once a year for all the sins of the people, but individuals, they bring it like this. Well, if you're struggling today with sin, you know what you need to do? You need to go back and put your hands on the cross. (laughs) Because you know what, guys? That sacrifice was a reminder of their sins. This sacrifice is a reminder of our forgiveness. 
And if you know Jesus and you're weighed down with guilt and shame, you need to go back to the cross again and put your hands on the cross and identify yourself with what Jesus did and that sin with Jesus and recognize that Jesus paid for that sin for all time and I've been perfected for all time and I've been forgiven for all time and keep on thanking him and thanking him daily in the face of the shame and the guilt that I feel until eventually that guilt and shame turns into the joy and the song of forgiveness in my heart in knowing that Jesus paid it all for me. Guys, we need to go back to the cross, put our hands on the cross to remind ourselves of what Jesus did and identify that sin with Jesus and his payment. But there's some here today that don't know Jesus. Guess what, your need is the same. For those who know Jesus, it's going back to the cross again. For those who don't know Jesus, it's for the first time and going and putting my hands on the cross and saying, you know what? God, up to this point, I've been trying to be good enough. I've been trying to be religious enough. I've been trying to do enough good deeds. I've been trying to be a good father, a good husband, a good kid, whatever it might be. And I've been trusting myself. But you know what, God? I recognize what he's talking about today is I'm certainly not holy and perfect like you are. And there's no way I can have a relationship with you unless there's perfection and holiness. And so you need to go put your hands on the cross for the first time so that all of a sudden the death of Jesus is identified as your death for your sins. Just like that animal in the Old Testament was identified as your death for your sins not that, that, re, that covered them, now we come to the cross that takes them away. And today, you need to come to the cross of Jesus. You need to come to Jesus for the first time. You need to admit to him. Say, Lord, you know what? My life doesn't measure up. There's no way I can ever be acceptable to you. But thank you, Jesus. You paid the price for me. And that moment you put your trust in him and you shift your dependence from yourself to the cross. At that moment, God will give to you that perfect righteousness that the law demanded, Jesus provided, fully acceptable to God, full access to God, complete salvation, Forgiven forever for all your sins for all time. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came and got a body as a baby so that you and I can enjoy a relationship with God because he laid down his life for us. Guys, let today be the day that if Somehow at this time, by God's grace, you're walking well. Thank Jesus for this. If you're carrying some guilt for sin, go back to the cross as a reminder of your forgiveness. And keep on reminding yourself daily with your hands on the cross until that guilt and shame turns into joy and a song of forgiveness. And if you don't know Jesus, make today the day. Because guys, the greatest gift of the world was Jesus Christ and the greatest Christmas gift you could ever get is the day you put your hands on Jesus by faith. And the old you is dead and gone and the brand new you with the perfect righteousness of Jesus given to you as a gift. So Father, thank you so much for Jesus coming. Thank you, Lord, that that baby in the cradle, who Jesus is, who is Jesus? That's what this whole series is about, Lord. He is the prophet that came to tell us the truth in a world that's full of darkness and confusion. And he is the priest who came to offer a sacrifice and pay a debt we could never pay ourselves. And so, Father, I want to thank you so much for what Jesus did for us as our priest. 
And God, I pray today that the truths we heard today, you would let them be yeasted into our heart. God, would they become truths that grow bigger and stronger in us day by day? Would they provide us great joy in a song because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us? It's in his name I pray. Amen.